over time I realized that the theory, in essence, no matter how easy the ideas are to understand, it still needs to be explained in simple terms. And I wrote this paper, How to Destroy Dead Stars So They Can Be Recycled. And the purpose of this paper, I'll read the abstract out for you. Methods for destroying dead stars are shown. Some methods leave rings and disks, some asteroids, some meteorites, some, inter some giant interstellar dust clouds. This is all based on the discovery outlined via stellar metamorphosis as stars evolve into what scientists call planet exoplanet. This means planets are ancient stars and nature destroys and recycles them. Just as a, uh, an, over an overreaching idea here, if you have a bunch of dust in outer space, dust to one centimeter sized, ball bearing sized meteorites, or should I say meteoroids, or I don't, I'm not too sure what you would call them in outer space, uh, pebbles, up to city sized asteroids, up to small moons, and even objects maybe the size of, you know, Ganymede. What does nature do with all these objects after they're dead and they're just floating in outer space? Well, it's simple. They enter into the atmospheres of much hotter, younger stars, and those stars disintegrate them and break them up and essentially recycle them. So all the rocks and minerals and all the elements that compose those rocks are broken up into their atomic components, completely ionized, and then the star differentiates that material, which then deposits into the interior, forming the new planet. So what we have here is an understanding that the Earth is not only one star altogether from brand new material, the Earth is a conglomeration of a vast amount of stars that have long since lived their entire lives, cooled, died, disintegrated from impacts in outer space, and then got recycled back into the Earth as the Earth was a young hot star itself, and then combined and melted down all the material and formed the core and, you know, all the chemistry that's involved with that. It's completely complex. It's just over my head, to be honest with you. But that being said, the Earth is made of stars of vastly, vastly different origins and way, way, way older than the Earth itself from some part of another distant galaxy very far into the past beyond the dogma of Big Bang. Many probably trillions and trillions of years ago because I sincerely believe the universe is eternal it doesn't have a beginning or an end but that being said if it doesn't have a beginning or an end that means everything recycles so we're literally probably composed of the same elements that were in the atmosphere of a very ancient star in some distant galaxy long 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 ago then we can't even I mean we're we're, we're made of the recycled remains of long dead stars which then form together inside the earth. But basically here I wrote a little diagram. I'll, I'll link this to the bottom but of course it, it can be um, it can be uh, um, developed more but I have objects when they hit something like Jupiter or they make close calls say something as large as Ganymede where instead of having a circular orbit would come in too close almost impact Jupiter just skim the outer atmosphere and just keep on going it would rip up large portions of Jupiter's outer atmosphere off the surface of Jupiter and make huge rings around it and with Saturn it's the rings are much larger and those rings are a result of impact events and of objects that have been destroyed and then Saturn is in the process of pulling those rings back in and you know allowing it to be reabsorbed back into Saturn which you know it's going to take a very very long very very long time and then you have total annihilation so sometimes 
say like a an object like the moon were to hit another moon if they're traveling at velocities far far beyond our comprehension of how something is fast like you know with Mach 1 or Mach 2 as opposed to the velocity of sound in air when they're traveling uh, magnitudes faster than that and they're in outer space like there there's nothing there's nothing to prevent that collision from happening they're they're gonna collide it's not like the vacuum that there's there's you know bumpers in between planets keeping them from colliding with one another they easily can collide and of course it's rare that that should happen but that could easily make a lot of interstellar shrapnel and we know that events like that happen because we already do have a lot of interstellar shrapnel I also put this pie chart here it says a total of 789,071 small solar system bodies as published by the MPC and 523,800 numbered minor planets are in green you see that there on the pie, pie chart over half a million and a quarter of a million 261,245 unnumbered minor planets and then what they call 4,000 comets but we all know all co a comet is just a that's an asteroid it, it's just a giant rock that has an elliptical orbit why they separate asteroid from comet I have no idea and because they appear different because of their elliptical orbits um, but um yeah and those are the objects that we see that we can actually observe meaning they're large enough to observe the, uh, the albedo is is high enough so light from the sun can reflect off of them and we see something moving across the sky very slowly that being said there are probably objects out there that far far outnumber the ones we even count which is three quarters of a million objects that are the size of uh, a house or a car probably tens of millions of objects lots of lots of interstellar shrapnel and nature inside the galaxy nature mother nature recycles this material by absorbing it into something like the sun and the sun breaks it apart and differentiates its interior as it cools and dies and of course a lot of the material is heavier so the heavier of that asteroid um, gets broken up separated from all the lighter materials lighter materials go to the top evaporate away from the star as it cools and dies and then the heavy material is left over like the iron and nickel or the osmium and all that all that good stuff um, as well let's see Oh yeah, here's another picture. Now, Alaska has a lot of different uh, sedimentary rocks and volcanic and intrusive um, igneous rocks that compose the state's mountain ranges and various other areas. Now, what I've found difficult to accept is the idea that plate tectonics can explain that because Alaska itself is on a single Alaskan plate or what they call the North American plate now if it's on one plate why are there so many different types of rocks in different areas all over Alaska why would there be so many different areas in so many different time frames separated by tens of millions of years and the answer to that is the surface of the earth the earth as we know it as we refer to it geologically speaking is not the remains of a liquid structure when the earth first formed the earth is the core essential structure of a gas giant and of course the gas giant is the remains of a very hot young star that's lost a lot of its hydrogen and it's collapsed significantly leaving a lot of other uh, heavier elements as it evolves but anyways the earth is the core remains of a very very old gas giant that's lost the vast majority of its atmosphere and only a thin layer of oxygen and nitrogen is left over on the surface and being that we can walk among the surface and take a look at these rocks we have to realize that these rocks were under extreme pressures gigapascal many many multitudes of gigapascal pressure under a very extremely thick gaseous envelope to the point to where earth 
many millions of tens of hundreds of millions of years in the past did not look like what it is today. And we know this because the rocks could not have formed in vacuum. They had to have formed under an extreme temperature and extreme pressure environment. But then when we walk around the mountain ranges and we, you know, pick up rocks off the ground, we're like, oh, this, this shows us, you know, the past. Well, yeah, it does in a way, but you have to remove yourself from our perspective. Like, oh, the atmosphere is one ATM, one atmospheric pressure. But it wasn't always like this. The atmosphere that we see now was extremely thick. It was, you couldn't host any life on the earth when it was that pressurized. And we're seeing evidence of how pressurized it was by studying the types of rocks that are available um, on the surface. And even some of them have, some of them have rise through, through the surface, the, 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 the igneous, the igneous, um, the igneous um, intrusions, I, I think is what you call them, where the igneous rock comes through, through the crust and then rises up because the entire earth is collapsing on itself and then the very hard parts come up through 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 the uh, through the crust and they get exposed and well that's that's for another talk but anyways for this how to destroy dead stars we have to kind of put ourselves with a mindset of not looking at things as being a beginning or an end you know, like mythology does, like um, the modern dogma of Big Bang where there's a beginning and then there's going to be an end. We have to look at the universe as being a perpetual thing. It doesn't have a beginning.